Well, as we start this session, the first thing I want to ask you to do is to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Galatians. And I want you to be finding what will be our text for this session, Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. And before I read our passage, I feel compelled uh, to say this, and that in our last session together with Dr. Sproul, that message came with such power and force and authority, I don't know about you, but my heart felt a sense of shock and awe as God came in the power of the Holy Spirit, I believe, upon our upon our souls as we heard that message, and as I have thought this through, just even the introduction to this message, I feel that I really need to put uh, both my feet um, in that message that we just heard and extend into this message by saying this. And Dr. Sproul reminded us of the Godness of God the holiness of God, the infinite, transcendent, majestic splendor of His all-perfect being, blameless and sinless, flawless. Matthew 5, 48, you shall be perfect as my heavenly Father is perfect. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, heaven and earth is full of His glory. Holy, holier than all of us, the holiest being in the entire universe, supreme in His holiness. In the sinfulness of man, in the sinfulness of sin, that we have all been weighed in the balances and found wanting. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And there is this infinite chasm that now separates holy God from sinful man. No way that we can approach this holy God in our own sinfulness, for we are defiled and corrupted by sin. And God is infinitely holy. His eyes are too pure then to behold iniquity. And the entire book of Leviticus written to, to show how can sinful man find acceptance with holy God, and he cannot come on his own. He must come by way of a sacrifice that has been prescribed by God. And the one that God has chosen as a substitutionary sacrifice is the only way that sinful man can enter into the presence of infinitely holy God. And this means by which we come into the presence of God is the gospel of grace. The higher that we set the holiness of God and the lower that we set the sinfulness of man, the greater we span the chasm of the infinite grace of God. In other words, we magnify grace by elevating holiness and putting man in his rightful place. But when we lower man, excuse me, lower God, and we compromise the holiness of God, and we do as Psalm 50 says, we make God in our own image. You thought I was just like you. And as we elevate man and lower God, then the span of which God's grace would cover that distance is it's just a very small grace. And so the gospel of grace is that this infinitely holy God who will not negotiate His holiness, who will not lower His standard one bit, who has exalted His throne in the heavens and His sovereignty rules over all. And we who have fallen in Adam and we who have fallen into the depths of sin, the only way by which we may find acceptance with this infinitely holy God, the only way, is by the grace of God that has been supremely and exclusively manifested in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Now Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus said there is, or Paul said there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Peter said there is salvation in no other name, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The Apostle Paul, as he writes the book of Galatians, understands what it is to be the chief of sinners. He understands what it is to to have fallen short of the glory of this God and to be saved by grace. Paul understood when he wrote, I am what I am by the grace of God. We see Paul on the Damascus Road as he is headed there to apprehend the Christians. And there where he is struck off of his high horse by sheer sovereign grace. What would you have me to do, Lord? And in that moment of monergistic sovereign regeneration... The Apostle Paul, who was not looking for God, who was not, or not looking for Christ, not seeking the gospel of grace, was apprehended by the grace of God. And Paul was made a minister of the gospel, a chosen instrument to proclaim the gospel of grace to the Gentiles. And so on Paul's first missionary journey in Acts 13 and 14, he is commissioned by the church, and he is sent out from Antioch to be the preacher of the grace of God, that salvation is the free gift of God, that salvation has been fully accomplished through the finality and the sufficiency of the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ, that he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and that by His one death He has reconciled us to God, that by His death He has propitiated forever the righteous anger of God for all those for whom He has died. Paul goes to the mission field in Acts 13 and 14. He preaches grace, saving grace, free grace, redeeming grace, reconciling grace. And he comes to the cities in the, church, the cities of Galatia, And he preaches the gospel there in the face of much opposition. And the power of the gospel comes crashing home into the hearts of those who heard him. And there were many disciples that were made. And he appointed out elders and he established churches. And he comes back to the church at Antioch and he gives the report to the church there. Before he goes to the Jerusalem council or perhaps at the same time, he receives word that the churches where he has preached the word, there has been a vacuum in his absence. And there have been false teachers who have come into the churches of Galatia. They are known by us as Judaizers. And they are those who have come in and they use the name of Christ, and they speak of grace, and they speak of faith, but they add to it man's efforts to keep the law, both in justification and for sanctification. And the Galatian believers were so easily swayed. They were naively gullible, and they were easily hoodwinked by these hucksters of the gospel who have come in and who have diluted and corrupted the purity of the gospel of grace. And they have added works, and they have added human merit, and they have added man's religiosity back into the purity of grace. And Paul receives the message He had just been there. In fact, he had warned them not to fall for the false teachers. And so he receives the report, and he writes these words beginning in verse 6. Normally at this place, Paul would say something like this, I thank my God for you. 
I have you in my heart. My every remembrance brings joy to me. But for writing this epistle, Paul is not thankful for what has taken place. There has been a breach of the gospel of grace. There has been a compromise. And this is a major issue. And so Paul, writing now this, the first of the 13 epistles, for this one, he does not dictate it. For this one, Paul is so exercised in his soul that he takes pen in hand and he writes it himself and he writes it in boxcar size letters so that a man can read it from the other side of the room so that there is no mistaking what he has to say as he now is a guardian of the grace of God. And so Paul writes his fieriest of all epistles And he writes, beginning in verse 6, I am amazed, I am astonished, I am shocked that you are so quickly deserting Him who called you by the grace of Christ. Can this be? For a different gospel, which is really not another Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, If any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. The reason that Paul is so consumed and obsessed with this is Paul well understands in his own life that Paul, who was born of the nation Israel, circumcised on the eighth day, born of the tribe of Benjamin, a zeal, a persecutor of the church, according to the law, blameless externally, Paul understood more than anyone else in the ancient world that the only way he could find acceptance with this infinitely holy God and find acceptance before the godness of God as he is a vile, corrupt sinner is through the amazing, extraordinary, extraordinary, infinite, pure, saving, redeeming, reconciling grace of God. And for there to be any compromise with the gospel of grace, that person should go to hell before he influences others to the broad path that is headed to destruction. We need to hear this in this day. As we minister the Word of God in the places in which God has assigned us, we are surrounded by many different gospels and many perversions of grace. There is the new perspective on Paul today that is a frontal attack on forensic justification by faith alone. It's not a matter of semantics. There is the ECT, 
and the compromise of justification by faith alone. There are non-lordship advocates who weaken what the nature of true saving faith is. There are those who teach a baptismal regeneration, etc., 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 etc. And there is a stewardship of the gospel that has been entrusted to each and every one of us. This is our hour in history. And we have all been made guardians of the gospel of Jesus Christ and guardians of the grace of God. And we must put ourselves into the skin of the Apostle Paul and vicariously feel what he felt, believe what he believed, and preach what he preached. As we look at these verses in this session, there are four things that I want you to note. I want you to note first Paul's amazement. He begins in verse 6, I am amazed. Uh, This word amazed means to be shocked, to be bewildered, to be astonished, to be astounded. To put it in the vernacular, Paul is dumbfounded. Paul is perplexed. He would say in street language today, this blows my mind. that you are so quickly deserting Him. Would you please note that to desert the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, to desert the purity of saving grace, is to desert the person of God Himself. Do you see this? God is one with His gospel. As John Piper has said, God is the gospel. To desert the grace of God in the gospel is to abandon God Himself. It is to go spiritually AWOL. It is to turn your back on God. It is to become a spiritual deserter in the midst of war. Why is God synonymous with His gospel? Because all of the attributes of God are supremely put on display in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you see the holiness of God? Then look to the cross and see the infinite chasm that separates God and man. Would you see the righteousness of God? Look to the cross and see that which is imputed to sinners who believe. Would you see the wrath of God? Look to the cross and see sin under condemnation and under judgment. Would you see the sovereignty of God? Look to the cross and see Christ triumphantly saving those for whom He came to save. Would you see the grace of God, the love of God, the mercy of God? It is supremely put on display in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the cross becomes the arms of God reaching out to lost sinners that He would save them by His grace. But to turn away from the gospel of grace is to desert God Himself. He then writes in verse 6, "...concerning God who called you by the grace of Christ." And this grace is unmerited. It is undeserved. Paul understands that. He knows that he is the least deserving person on the earth to become the recipient of such a bestowal who called you by the grace of God. If you would turn just a moment to chapter 2 and verse 16, just to isolate a text, a verse that helps put a frame around this grace of God. It's the first time that Paul mentions justification in inspired Scripture. It is the first time that Paul puts his pen to the parchment and writes in this epistle as well as any epistle of justification by faith alone. 
And notice when he writes in verse 16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. Paul is the master teacher here. He uses both negative denial and positive assertion. There's no room for misunderstanding. There is no wiggle room in verse 16. There is no place for anyone to misunderstand what is the grace of God in the gospel. Negatively, he says three times in one verse that it is not by the works of the law. That man makes no contribution to his own salvation except the sin that nailed Christ to the cross. And then with positive assertion, he says three times that we are justified by faith in Christ Jesus, and then faith in the verb form, believed in Christ Jesus, and then he comes back and says a third time, faith in Christ Jesus. To be justified is to be put in a right standing of perfect acceptance with holy God. There are three metaphors that really communicate to us what is the essence and the heart of justification. Now, the first is a legal metaphor in which we find ourselves in the judgment hall of God, in the courtroom of God, standing before the judgment seat of God, and we have all been condemned by our sin and fall infinitely short of the godness of God. Standing next to us is our advocate, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the perfection of His life and the perfection of His death has met all of the requirements of the law that we ourselves have broken again and again and again. And when we put our faith in Christ apart from any works of the law, God looks upon Christ and justifies us. And there is the great exchange of justification. That all of my sin laid upon Christ and His perfect righteousness laid upon me. The great exchange, the worst about me given to Him, the best about Him given to me, and God's gavel comes down and God forensically, legally declares me to be the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. The life that I have never lived the life that Christ perfectly lived, and His sin-bearing substitutionary death, it is imputed to me. And I now stand before the judgment bar of God, declared to be the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. That is the first metaphor And it is all by faith alone in Christ alone. The second metaphor is that of the marketplace of financial transaction. That as I stand before God, I am spiritually bankrupt before a holy God. I am poor in spirit. I have no spiritual capital with which to pay off my sin debt. That Jesus Christ is infinitely great in spirit, the spiritual wealth of His grace, His saving grace, and His mercy. And my sin put into His account and His perfect righteousness put into my account. I who, is a, who am a, a spiritual pauper, I who am spiritually bankrupt before a holy God, I now become the riches of the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it has been credited to my account. My sin credited to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this transaction by faith in Christ alone. And then the third transaction, or the third metaphor, is that of the clothing arena. In my own sin, 
My righteousness is as filthy rags before a holy God. I cannot come into the king's banquet hall in my own filthy, dirty rags. Jesus Christ is infinitely holy, infinitely pure, infinitely perfect, and in the act of justification, the robes of my own self-righteousness, which is as filthy rags in the sight of the godness of God, is taken off of me and placed upon Christ, and Him who knew no sin, God made to be sin for me. And the robes of His perfect righteousness, His active obedience, His sinless death, I am now robed in the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. And now when God looks upon me, the holy, holy, holy God looks upon me, there is now a covering for my sin. And God sees me in the perfect righteousness of His own Son, Jesus Christ. It is all by grace. The entirety of both of His righteousness given to me and even the repentance and the faith with which I believe upon Him, it is all of grace. And so Paul writes back in chapter 1, verse 6, I am amazed, I am shocked, I am stunned that you are so quickly deserting Him who called you by the grace of God, note this, for a different gospel. There are only two kinds of gospels. There is the true gospel, and there is a false gospel. There is a saving gospel, and there is a non-saving gospel. There is the gospel of divine accomplishment, and there is the gospel of human achievement. And the gospel of human achievement, whereby sinful man makes contribution to the finality and the perfection of the death of Christ and the perfect life of Christ, Paul says it is a different gospel, and at the beginning of verse 7, which is really not another. It is a counterfeit gospel. It is a sham salvation. It is a fake message. It is a rip-off religion. It is a mangled message which cannot save. Paul says, I'm amazed that you have abandoned God for another gospel. We should be equally shocked in our day for those who abandon the gospel of grace. I was listening on television not long ago to Larry King Live, and there were a collection of religious leaders on this program. And one of them is probably the most popular religious leader of our day, who preaches in an NBA coliseum. King said, we've had ministers on who said, you either believe in Christ or you don't. If you believe in Christ, you're going to heaven, and if you don't, no matter what you have done in this life, you ain't. Well, we know who that minister is who said that. He's out in Los Angeles. John MacArthur. Response. Yeah, I don't know. There's probably a balance. I believe you have to know Christ, but I think that if 
you know, Christ, if you're a believer in God, uh, you're going to have some good works. I think it's a cop-out to say, I'm a Christian, but I don't ever do anything. It's a total evasion of the question that was asked. King, what if you're Jewish or Muslim and you don't accept Christ at all? National television, international television. Answer. You know, I'm very careful about saying who would and who wouldn't go to heaven. I don't know. King, if you believe you have to believe in Christ, they're wrong, aren't they? Well, I don't know. <laughs> if I believe they're wrong, I spent a lot of time with Daddy in India. I don't know all about their religion, but I know they love God. I don't know. They seem so sincere. I don't know. You and I had better know what the gospel truth is. We better get the gospel right, to quote a book title. And we better get on the housetops and cup our voice and shout it as far and as wide as the gospel message can go forward. Jesus saves, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. This is Paul's amazement. This is Paul's astonishment. It ought to shock us and astonish us in this hour that there are so many who are tongue-tied we must roar like a lion. Now I want you to note second Paul's adversaries. In verse 6, excuse me, verse 7. Only there are some who are disturbing you. And let me tell you this, whenever the gospel is compromised, it will always disturb the church greater than any other disturbance. The gospel is God himself, and it is the chief cornerstone of the church. It is upon this rock that he will build his church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. But for this solid rock to be compromised brings extraordinary disturbance to the church. Only there are some who are disturbing you. He doesn't mention them by name. But these some are the Judaizers who are trying to bring their legalism and their works righteousness into the church to tell sinners that you've got to do all of these things in order to believe that the death of Christ is not final and is not sufficient to save sinners. In addition, they are bringing this legalism to the believers to retard their sanctification to prevent them from growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of grace. They are greatly troubling the church. Specifically, they are saying Christ and grace and faith are good as far as they go. But they are alone, alone, inadequate to save or to sanctify. Human works, by keeping the law, are necessary for salvation, and the works of the flesh are necessary for sanctification. And they were saying you have to be circumcised to be saved. You have to keep the Ten Commandments to be saved. You have to observe the holy days to be saved. You have to practice the ceremonial law to find acceptance before God. These are the adversaries of Paul. They are the adversaries of the church. 
And we have these adversaries in our day as well. And they are those who claim that salvation is by faith and good works. Faith and water baptism. Faith and church membership. Faith and speaking in tongues. Faith and Hail Marys. Faith and the Mass. Faith and last rites. Faith and the treasury of merit. Faith and the buying of indulgences. Faith and, faith and, faith and. And there are others who clearly deny the essential truths of the gospel and of Christianity. They deny the Trinity. They deny the absolute deity of Christ. They deny the lordship of Christ. They deny the virgin birth of Christ. They deny the sinless life of Christ. They deny the substitutionary death, the bodily resurrection, the second coming of Christ. They deny that justification is forensically imputed to the sinner who believes upon Christ at the moment of saving faith. As they say that justification will come perhaps in the final judgment in the end if one has done their part to keep the good works, and in the end they will be justified by a holy God. Such are adversaries of the gospel of Christ. Others deny the exclusivity of salvation in Jesus Christ. These are the adversaries of the gospel. Paul said there is a good fight, and it is the fight for the purity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to note third, Paul's anathemas. In verses 9 and 10, these false teachers of Paul's day, these Judaizers, sought to undermine Paul's authority and teaching it in every way they could. And so Paul had to respond boldly because the purity of the gospel is at stake and because the eternal destinies of souls are at stake. So Paul writes in verse, in verse 8, But even if we, referring to himself and and Barnabas and, and whoever would have been in his traveling entourage, even if we are an angel from heaven, be it Michael the archangel, be it Gabriel, be it one of the chief angels, be it one of the ruling angels, be it one of the guardian angels, be it one of the seraphim or the cherubim, if any one of the elect angels should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, contrary to the message of salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, Paul says he is to be accursed. The word accursed means to be devoted to destruction. It means to be consigned to the flames of eternal hell below. It means to be damned, to be eternally condemned. Martin Luther writes at this point, here Paul is is breathing fire. His zeal is so fervent that he almost begins to curse the angels themselves. There must be no neutrality when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. James Montgomery Boyce writes, how can it be otherwise? If the gospel Paul preaches is true, then both the glory of Jesus Christ and the salvation of men are at stake. Boyce writes, if men can be saved by works, Christ has died in vain. The cross is emptied of meaning. Boyce writes, if men are taught a false gospel, they are being led from one thing that can save them and are being turned to destruction, close quote. How true are the words of Boyce because they are the very words of Paul in this text. And then if that were not enough, in verse 9, Paul now reloads and repeats what he said in verse 8. And he turns from the hypothetical to the actual. And he says in verse 9, as we have said before, 
Meaning that when he was there in Galatia, Paul told them this very truth, that the gospel of grace is the only way of salvation, and if any false prophets or false teachers preach to you another gospel, they are to be devoted to destruction. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man be he an apostle, be he a spiritual leader in the church, may he be any person. If any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you have received, he is to be accursed. Those are very serious words. And they should call all of us here who understand the godness of God and the sinfulness of man and the spam, span of the infinite grace of God, that there is no other way to find access or acceptance before this holy God. This should call all of us not only to preach and to proclaim the truth, but to be as Paul and to fight for the very purity of the gospel of Christ. I would remind all of us that Paul is putting this on the front doorsteps of this book. At a place when he would normally say, I offer thanks for you, Paul has a bee in his bonnet. Paul is riled because the gospel of Jesus Christ and His grace have been compromised. So I want you to see finally Paul's aim. In verse 10, we see Paul's aim. As Paul concludes this section, he gets down to the bottom line. And the bottom line that stands behind this issue for Paul as a minister and as a preacher and as a servant of the Lord is, who is he trying to please? Is he trying to please God or is he trying to please man? Is he trying to have a popular ministry and gain the acceptance of people in his community or is Paul seeking amens out of heaven? That is the fundamental question before each and every one of us here today. And so we see in verse 10, Paul asks these questions. These are soul-searching questions. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? Paul reasons with us, and he is saying, if I am seeking the favor of men, I would certainly tone down my rhetoric. But Paul is not courting the approval of men, and certainly not the Judaizers, nor anyone who is sympathetic to the message of the Judaizers. Instead, Paul is seeking the approbation of God. Paul has learned a very important lesson in ministry. If you please God, it does not matter whom you displease. And if you displease God, it does not matter whom you please. Gospel ministry is very simple. It is one-dimensional in this sense. We must please God. It will be God before whom we will stand in the last day and give an account as a steward to His Master of how faithful we have been to preserve the purity of His message and to preach it and dispense it while upon this earth. This confrontational, harsh language by Paul is hardly calculated to win the approval of men. Men pleasers simply do not hurl anathemas against those who proclaim false gospels. But Paul is not a man pleaser, Paul is a God pleaser. And so, therefore, he brings strong words. I remember hearing John MacArthur preach one time, and he spoke a sentence that just electrified my heart. 
He said, now is the time for the strongest men to preach the strongest message in the context of the strongest ministry. I thought, God, I want to be one of those strong men. I want to be one of those who brings the unvarnished, unadulterated, strong message of the Word of God in the context of the strongest ministry. So Paul concludes in verse 10, If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. In the ultimate sense, pleasing men and pleasing God are mutually exclusive. They cannot be mutually inclusive, not in the ultimate sense. We must make a choice whether to please God or whether to please men. Bottom line, this is not an either or, or it is an either or, not a both and. Either we seek to please men, and if we do, we will displease God. And if we seek to please God, we will find ourselves at times displeasing men. But bottom line, it cannot be both ways. Jesus put it this way, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. Every one of us must come to this fork in the road and decide whether we will be men-pleasers or God-pleasers in ministry. Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 2.4, We have been entrusted with the gospel, so we speak. Not as pleasing men, but God who examines our hearts. Paul told Timothy, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. And will turn away their ears from the truth and will turn aside to myths. This is a day, this is an hour in which we must stand strong in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We must be unwavering and uncompromising to this gospel of grace. And as those around us who would be capitulating to the whims of the time, who would be like the wave of the sea tossed back and forth, who are adding to the grace of God, human merit, human works, works righteousness, who would be denying justification by faith alone in Christ alone. Let us be those who say with Paul, I choose to please God and not men. I will be unwavering by God's grace to the purity of the message that has been entrusted to me. I think of John Knox after he returned from Geneva back to Edinburgh in Scotland. As he preached the Word of God in such a bold and fearless way, I think of Mary who then assumed the throne. And her first Sunday back in Edinburgh, she went into Holyrood Castle And there she had a private mass. The next Sunday, John Knox ascended to the pulpit in St. Giles Church, and he said, I fear one mass more than all of the marching armies of Europe that would descend upon this kingdom. Mary heard about this sermon And she sent her servants to fetch John Knox and to bring him down to Holyrood for a private audience with this preacher. And as John Knox stepped in, and there was Queen Mary, and surrounded by layers and tears of her 
government officials and her counselors, she began to address John Knox. It would have been an easy time for him to say, oh, we're all just saying the same thing. It would have been an easy thing for John Knox to have said, I don't know. But John Knox began to preach the eternal gospel of Jesus Christ to this woman who had not yet put her faith and her trust in the sufficiency and the finality and the perfection of the one atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he called her to repentance and he called her to turn away from her vain religion and to put her trust and her faith in the living God through Jesus Christ. And Mary was reduced... Her biographer said, to a puddle of tears and sounded like a howling animal. Where are preachers like that today? It's been well said, the problem with preachers today is nobody wants to kill them anymore. We must understand we're not in this for a popularity contest. We are in this for God. When John Knox was buried, and today he is buried what is under the parking lot outside of St. Giles Church, as they lowered him into the grave, the ambassador from France said, Here lies a man who never feared another man. God, give us such boldness. The righteous flee when no man pursues. The righteous are as bold as a lion. Make us steeped deeply in the gospel of grace and in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us be unmoving and and unwavering in our commitment to sola fide and sola grati and solas Christos, based upon sola scriptura for soli deo gloria, for the glory of God alone. And may God use us in this hour and in this generation to preach the gospel of grace, because there is no other way that sinful man can find acceptance with the godness of God except through this one atoning sacrifice and man's faith in this risen, living, triumphant Savior, Jesus Christ. May God give us grace to preach His message of grace in this hour. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for such a glorious gospel that you have entrusted to us. We know that it comes with great responsibility and great accountability, and there is a stewardship that is entrusted to us. We know on that last day we will stand before you at the judgment seat of Christ, and we will give an account to you for how open and how faithful We have been in the ministry of Your Word. Lord, I pray that You would use even this conference and this time that we have together as we are reminded of Your holiness and our unholiness, as we are reminded of the infinite, immeasurable, immutable grace that is found in the cross of Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that you would seal to our hearts this gospel message and that we would be those who would preach it to the kings and the queens of this world and fear no man as we proclaim the message. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ the one who became sin for us, that we might become His righteousness. Amen.